One of the big trends of Japanese literature in the 20th century was something called the shisho setsu, or the eye novel, which is a form of literary autofiction, which was really, really popular with a lot of Japanese authors throughout the 20th century. And it basically straddles a line between an autobiography and a piece of fiction. It is a piece of fiction that is based on the author's own life, their own lived experiences, their own philosophies. It might be embellished in some way, it might blend truth and fiction, or it might be a completely truthful biography, but because it's written in a more novelistic style, where it focuses perhaps on a single day rather than an entire lifetime, or it focuses on a certain aspects of a person's life, like their romantic life or their professional life, it stands out as more a piece of fiction based on your life than it is an autobiography. And that's why the term autofiction, eye novel, shisho setsu, is really important to separate this from just biography. An eye novel by Minae Mizumura is perhaps the definitive example of this, and we finally get to read it in English after it was published about 25 years ago in Japanese. Why this book took so long to get published is quite an interesting story, but before we get there, let's just talk about what exactly an eye novel is about. Minae Mizumura is now regarded as one of Japan's great writers, but she had a pretty interesting life before she got there. When she was around the age of 12, her father got a job in New York City and moved the entire family there from Tokyo. And suddenly, Mizumura is now an American. She is now living a life in English. She's going to a school and studying and writing and reading all in English, and she's pretty much leaving the Japanese language behind. Fast forward 20 years. After 20 years of living in New York, she's in her early 30s. She's studying for a PhD, and she has decided that she wants to be a writer and she wants to be a writer in Japanese. She wants to rediscover her, her roots and her culture and her language through being a writer. She's inspired by the works of Natsume Sosuke, and she believes that she can create a great work of fiction, or at least she hopes that she can. And what she starts with is creating a book based on her own life. This is a book that tells its own story. It is a final result that includes the very bricks that it's made of. It's a book about the journey of becoming the book that we have. Very interesting. Is it meta? I don't know if it's meta. Everything's meta these days. Whatever it is, it's very, very interesting. So this book is told over the course of pretty much a single day, the 20th anniversary of Minae and her sister Nanae arriving in New York, arriving in the States. It's been 20 years. And during this day, she decides that she's going to move back to Tokyo and try to become a writer. And what we have here is about 300 pages that is a blend of what happens over this single day and reminiscences about the past. Her thinking back on her youth in Japan, which now seems like a faded memory. It seems fantastical. What she remembers of it is embellishments and a fog and things that may or may not be true. And then there's her more vivid memories of her time in New York City, her time in Boston, her time studying at school and university, and the relationship between her and her sister, especially as they grew up in New York together, and the fact that one of them has gone on a very different path to the other, and they have very different outlooks on life. And as the book goes on, you kind of realize that the two of them have struggled with being close as sisters. There's a moment in the book where Nanae explains to Minae that she desperately wanted to go back to Japan at one time. She dreamed of it. She had this recurring dream of returning to Tokyo, but at no point did she actually communicate that to her sister, so this seems like a revelation. Both of them are now in their 30s and they're learning about each other. A lot of the book is about long phone call conversations between the two of them. Nanae is in Manhattan and she's living a life that she feels like is a failed one. She's a failed failed artist. She's a, a failed pianist, I think? A failed musician? And Minae has this dream of now returning to Tokyo and becoming a writer. And a lot of the philosophical musings that you find in this book are about what she found when she arrived in the States, the differences between people. There's a brilliant bit about halfway through the book where she first arrived at a school in the States to find different attitudes between girls at this school, attitude towards boys, makeup and hair and what they wear and what they prioritize in their daily lives and even the bags that they carry their books in. There's all these little details that are really informative and interesting. But the book is bigger than this. Although it's all about Minae and her life and her journey of being a 
bilingual person floating between two cultures and trying to rediscover herself and return to her roots and all of that. What's way more interesting about this is the fact that it is a book about language and translation and how we communicate ourselves, express ourselves, understand ourselves with regards to our language. And that's why this is considered not just Japan's, but the world's first bilingual novel. As to why this book took so long to come out in English, I'm not exactly sure of the main reason, but the journey that it's taken to get to English is fascinating. Juliet Winters Carpenter is the translator of this book. Juliet Winters Carpenter has also translated Mizumura's other great novel, which is called A True Novel. And my mate Arthur actually lent me a copy of this book and I never got around to reading it because it's pretty long, but A True Novel is a retelling of one of my favourite English language novels, Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, but it's told and set within New York City based on the experiences that Mizumura had. So Mizumura is very much someone who writes what she knows. And A True Novel came out a few years ago, and I've seen a lot of people reading it recently, probably because they're excited for this to come out, which is a brand new release at the time of recording. So I haven't read A True Novel, but I have read Juliet Winters Carpenter's, that's a really hard thing to say, uh, her translation of Kobo Abe's Secret Rendezvous. I've mentioned Kobo Abe a few times in videos because he's a very surrealist Kafka-esque writer who really left a mark on me when I was reading a bunch of his books recently. And Secret Rendezvous was actually my favorite book of his that I read. And she won awards for translating this book because translating a Japanese Kafka-esque piece of fiction is probably a very, very tall order. And she did an exquisite job. Here, however, she was up against a whole other challenge because this book, as I've said, is a bilingual novel. Minae Mizumura wrote this book primarily in Japanese, but all the way through, every single page is peppered with words, phrases, and entire sentences in English. So if you read this book in the original Japanese, you get a lot of Japanese. The main story is in Japanese. It was all written in kanji, hiragana, katakana, but there's English. And not just romaji, but actual phrases of English peppered all the way through it because Mizumura writes and speaks in English. And in fact, writing this book was kind of a journey of rediscovery of her native language, which she had left behind for about 20 years. In, in the book, she remarks on the fact that she hasn't read any Japanese or written any Japanese in so long. She's rediscovering her language. And as she writes the book, the fact that it's bilingual is perhaps its most important and most fascinating point. Because as you read this book, the bits that are written in English are words that seem immediately untranslatable. A lot of it is proper nouns, the names of places, brands, universities, cities, people. These are words that are English. They are innately English. There is no alternative for them because that is the proper noun, proper name of that thing. And so a lot of those things she puts the English in as a mark of translation, as, as, as almost like a, a syntax error. Absolutely fascinating. But if you're reading this book wholly in English through Juliet Winters Carpenter's translation, well, it's all in English. And therein lies the interesting thing. The only way around it that Carpenter could find was to write it all out in English, all the Japanese is in English, and the bits that were originally written in English by Mizumura are just in bold. And occasionally you do forget that this book was originally written in Japanese. You really have to keep that in mind all the way through because you have to remember that the bits that are in bold and the bits that aren't in bold are supposed to be two different languages. And if you just keep that in mind all the way through the book, then it really does hit as hard as it's supposed to. It probably hits as hard as it did in the original language. In the translator's notes, she quotes Mizumura when she wrote another book and remarked on writing this book and said that this book can be translated into any language in the world except for English. And that's a really interesting point. I'm just going to read it out because it's easier that way. Any writer writing in a language other than English can reasonably expect her reader to understand some, if not most, of the English words that she might happen to throw in. It would therefore be possible to replicate the bilingual form of Shishosetsu from left to right in any language in the world, be it Korean, Bengali, or French, by translating the Japanese and leaving the English parts as they are. The only language in which this wouldn't work 
would be English. Indeed, the very impossibility of maintaining the bilingual form while translating the work into English, and the singularity of that impossibility, are clear testimony to the linguistic asymmetry we now face in this world. So this quote is taken from The Fall of Language in the Age of English, which was written by Mizumura. And it's a very, very interesting point because suddenly the bilingual aspect of this book, which is so philosophically and thematically integral to the book itself, is lost if you translate it into English. Because you translate the Japanese part of the book to any other language and keep the English the same, as she says, most people are gonna understand those English words. If they're words like Princeton University, written in English, most people around the world will know what that is. But if you translate the Japanese into English and you just see Princeton University in bold, it doesn't carry that same weight. But Juliet Winters Carpenter did what she could, and all you have to do as a reader is keep in mind that the original text was in Japanese, and the effect is there. So nothing is really lost in that sense. And I'm hugely relieved because that bilingual aspect, the theme and philosophy behind that bilingualness of this book, is so important, and without it, the book doesn't have the same weight. It is, it is integral. And it's one of the few books that I've read where the very mechanics of the book, the grammar of the book, the structure of the book, is what sells and supports and reiterates the very theme and emotional core of the book. It's not what Mizumura is telling us so much as how she tells it. The book is interesting, don't get me wrong. It's a fascinating read, and it's really, really interesting to see this journey that she's going on and how the book blends a day in a single life, or a life in a single day, with memories and things that are half-remembered and misremembered, and happy moments in her past, and unhappy moments, and questions that she's asking, and struggles that she's going through. All of this is very interesting stuff. But as this is all being written and told and read by us in two languages, really hammers home every single theme of the book. If you look at the theme of home and belonging, the fact that it's written in two languages demonstrates the fact that home is a very complicated thing to her. Where is her home? Where was her home? Where will her home be in the future? This is reinforced by the bilingualness of this book. And then if you look at the theme of language in this book, well, it's written in two languages, and the importance of language to her is demonstrated by the fact that she has to write in two languages. She has an inability to write entirely in Japanese or in English. She must merge the two because she is a merging of the two. She has lived both of them, and they are now a part of her. She exists in this wonderful cauldron of English and Japanese together. So every theme and every idea and every feeling that Mizumura has in this book is demonstrated even further by the fact that this is a bilingual book. It's an absolute revelation. And it's very, very wonderful that the vehicle of this book, the grammar, the structure, the language, the bilingualness of it, the vehicle is as interesting as the contents. As you're enjoying the story, you're also enjoying what the story is contained within, this bilingual structure. It's absolutely brilliant. And it, if at any point you find that there's a moment that you don't really care about, you're not too bothered about a certain detail or a certain story beat, just remembering the context and the grammar and the structure of it all really carries it all through. It's absolutely fantastic. And yeah, the contents are absolutely brilliant, but because this is an eye novel, this is a work of autofiction. An eye novel doesn't have a set structure. It is up to her when she chooses to present a moment of the present day, that single day that the book covers, and when she decides to move back in time, and where she decides to move to. All the way through the book, about 300 pages, all the way through, we are darting through time. We might at one point be in her original neighborhood in Tokyo where she lived, or we might be at a friend's house, or we might be at a school in New York City, or it might be a conversation she had with her sister that she doesn't quite remember, but she's trying to piece it together because it's relevant to the conversation she's having with her sister now. And in fact, speaking of, as I've already mentioned, the relationship between Minae and Nanae is the most important aspect of this book, aside from the bilingualness of an eye novel. I think the relationship between the two of them is really, really enlightening. And it goes to show how a very, very similar lived experience between two people who are of the same gender, roughly the same age, from the same family, who moved abroad at the same time, can have such different experiences and different relationships to their previous culture, the current culture, however you want to phrase it. They are 
in so many ways the same person. They, they are so close together and yet so far apart. And so in terms of the story and the plot, that is the most interesting part of this book. And when you put that together with the incredible philosophical and thematic importance of the bilingual aspect of this book, it's quite a treasure. Really, really incredible book. I'm so happy that I finally got to read a book by Minae Mizumura. I need to read a true novel. I love Wuthering Heights, and I'm now very, very sold on her writing and Juliet Winters Carpenter's translation. But that book is intensely large. I don't know when I'm going to get to it. I also need to borrow it from Arthur again. Arthur, if you're watching this, can I borrow it again? Anyway, this is fantastic. An Eye Novel is absolutely worth your time. Please pick it up, especially if you're a fan of Japanese culture, Japanese literature, and anything to do with translation and the work of translation and the work of expressing ourselves through language and the way that language both limits and freeze our ability to communicate ourselves. Really, a lot to take in, a lot to think about. And the fact that this isn't a work of philosophy or history, this is one person's lived experiences, but it means so much to so many of us, that really hits hard. If you want more details about our lives and what we get up to and the books that we're reading and little insights into what we're doing at any given time, please consider subscribing to our Patreon. You'd be helping us out an awful lot. And as always, subscribe for books.